right, welcome back to SimFest 2023. This is the first time we're in person since 2019, if I'm not mistaken. Good to have everyone back in this room, and it's glad to, I'm glad to be back in here, especially kicking things off, as I did back in 2016 as well. I think uh, it works out perfectly. So I'm Anthony Obando. I'm going to be talking to you guys about the history of video games today. Uh, I think there's suppo I'm supposed to say something about myself. I teach high school now, no longer middle school. They saved me from that. So now I'm, te I'm teaching judgmental high schoolers instead of judgmental middle schoolers. All right, so let's get talking about video games. So I'm going to open up the same way that I did back in 2016 about thinking about how we got here. Because it's now 2023, where it have nine generations of consoles. And now we're so obsessed about these graphics that we kind of forgot about how we even got here. Because it isn't about the making the pretty game, it's about making a game that works. So let's actually see games that worked and how we got here. So let's start back in World War II with some guy named Alan Turing. I don't know if you've heard of this guy or if you've even watched Imitation Game or anything related to CS. I think some people know a thing or two here about CS, maybe. Maybe. Some of you guys got degrees. Some of you are going through the track. I mean, we have the chair here. Hey, Dr. Khan. <laughs> we have the chair here. I think maybe he knows a thing or two. Maybe? Okay. So after World War II finished, which, spoiler alert, the Nazis lost, I, I think that's like a, I think that's major spoilers. I don't know. I haven't read my history book in a while. Uh, Turing finished up the project at Bletchley Park and then moved on to work with artificial intelligence. And at this time, games are not being made for entertainment. Games are just strictly for testing technology. Whole point is we want to we have this cool hardware. We want to see if we can push this. So make something that will see if it will break or not. So you start making games. Originally, it was a chess simulator, and then 10 years in 1948, and then 10 years later, we get the first game that was designed for entertainment, Tennis for Two. It, it was for entertainment, but still, they had this idea of, we want to see what we can do with technology. But then it wasn't until 1962 that MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, got to give credit where credit's due and make sure I say all my acronyms fully, released the first commercialized game. And then we enter our first generation of consoles, our first generation of games, technically. So from 63 to 78, I know that there's always uh, someone, there's always different resources that tell me uh, that I'm wrong, but I'm going to tell them that they're wrong as well, even though I have no credible sources, and they have no credible sources, because this is all really from two people who've gone on Wikipedia for way too long. So 63 to 78, we start with having quarter-operated cabinets, because when people realize, hey, you can make money off of this, Business people are going to do what business people do best, and that is going to commercialize it, make money off of it. So spend a quarter, play a game. You have different games that were made between that, and then we reach a point that, hey, here's a novel idea. Take the video games home. You don't have to worry about going to arcade anymore. You take this home with you. So a little company called Magnavox created the first console in uh, 1972, the Magnavox Odyssey. And they had this whole thing of, you know, no processor, we'll sell this for $100. And uh, you'll also get some cool overlays that you attach to your TV that comes with this. Because you didn't have any graphics for this whatsoever. It was all black and white. And they just kind of expected you to put the overlay on the TV as well. I mean, it was one heck of a cartridge. This is, this is advanced. This is advanced right here. Only selling 28 games, really, on one platform. But then the first real console was the Fairchild Channel F and... Uh, 1976 selling for about $170, which that's $500 in our currency right now. You got to account for inflation. Spending way too much still. Spending way too much on a console. Then a year later, Atari joins the mix of making game consoles with the Atari 2600, $200. And this will be the console that kind of drives video games all the way until the crash in 83. Spoiler alert. Video games die for a little bit and then come back. Uh, but the main problem with this has always been PC. Because, yeah, it's great that you have these cool graphics, but my PC can run text-based games. I got Theater of the Mind. What do you got? I got Theater of the Mind. You got these, like, really bad-looking graphics and also a light gun. A toy gun, really, that you're going to connect that? I'll go buy a real one, and then I'll also have my text-based games while I'm at it. So after 78, we enter into what is known as the golden age of video games. And uh, it's hard to now define what retro is, but this was retro at one time. So arcade cabinets were coming up, were the up and up. But unfortunately, pool tables and pinball tables were just more popular. Still a little bit better at that time. 
this is when we start getting games that we know of, like Galaga, Space Invaders. You have your early shoot 'em ups. We have Pac Man, Donkey Kong, a few other games coming out at this time. PC gaming is now being more popular with the ZX Spectrum. I now realize that I said it wrong all those years back by calling it the ZX Spectrum. It is the ZX Spectrum. Uh, hopefully, the Brits don't come for me. If they do, they uh, I'll give them the address of um, my old workplace. They don't have to come for me at where I'm at now. Uh, the Commodore as well, Commodore 60, the Commodore VIC 20 to the Commodore 64, and also at this time you have handhelds. Some company I don't know if you've heard of them called Milton Bradley. They make board games. Uh, they actually made the first handheld, the Microvision. But you're selling that for a hundred dollars, and the cartridge is actually the faceplate. So then yeah, your whole thing of you want to replace the game, cool. Just take off the little faceplate, put on a brand new one. Totally not going to break your console by that point after you switch it maybe three times and then also Nintendo created the Game & Watch so these mini games that you'd have in your pocket that you just like fold up like a modern Nintendo DS stuck in your pocket take it out play a little bit so 1983 now I need to give a little bit of context for this we got to look at 1982 really quick because this is early 1983 1982, um, I don't know if you guys have heard of Steven Spielberg or seen any of his movies. I know some of you have, especially if you've seen the Danger Dice setup out there and you know every single reference that's coming from that, then you've definitely seen a Spielberg film. So he made this little movie called E.T. that is now reaching, I think, like, what, 40th anniversary this year or something? It was last year? I Math is not my strong suit. They had me teach math for a year, and then they got rid of me because I was doing too good at it. Uh, but he releases E.T., which at this time, this is the summer movie to watch. This is the movie to watch. Everyone's seeing it. It's great. So companies are going to do what they do best. They see something that's making a lot of money. They want to jump on that bandwagon. All right, that's making money. we got to do something that's going to make money as well. Make a game of it. Let me see that happen now. People make games. But at this time, this is one of the first movies to make, get a game made of it. It would be great, right? Make it in six months with people that don't know what they're doing. I think anyone who has uh, actually made a game here knows that nowadays it's almost impossible to make a good game in six months. Unless you want a ton of bugs in there. Joe, your shirt speaks for itself about fixing games and debugging it. We so, game sells, Christmas morning, kids are opening it, they put it in their Atari 2600, and it's bad. It's just bad. But you know what the biggest problem with all this was? They didn't read the instruction manual. Because in order to play games at this time, you had to do this little thing called reading. Something that I think a lot of us have forgotten about. I don't know who reads in here still. <laughs> you don't get to say anything anymore for the rest of the presentation. <laughs> I'm revoking your talking privileges. So... They didn't read the instruction manual because they're so excited to get this new toy. They want to play it, and then they don't know what's going on. So then they complain and send it back because we didn't have internet forums that you could just say, hey, patch your game. Add a tutorial. No, they just sent it back. So now all these stores are having a, all their product coming back, and what are they going to do with it? They can't sell it. No one wants it. Every, it's word of mouth. Everyone's telling everybody, hey, this game sucks. Don't get it. Don't get it for your kids. It was a waste of my money. They hated it, and they sent it back. So now they send it back all the way to the game developers. And what are they going to do with all this stock? They bury it. Because what are you going to do? Sell it on eBay? No. We haven't hit 2000. No one's going to want to care. No one cares about getting retro yet. This is the modern times. So they go out to the middle of New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada, somewhere in that area, and they just dig a ditch and bury all of it. And then they sw everyone swears off video games in 1982, saying, no, no more. Because the other problem was that games are being half done. You have incomplete games that are being shelled out for a dime a dozen. And they're expecting you to take this. I mean, we're still doing that. Look at anyone. Look at uh, Battlefield. Call of Duty. Yeah, sorry. What? Uh, I think uh, is someone. You, you okay? You okay? Hey, don't say anything about Pokemon. I will die on that hill. <laughs> Graphics don't make a game. So, 
we had also a lot of innovative consoles at this time die. A lot of consoles at this time you had actually the consoles built into a TV. So you'd buy a TV and a console at the same time. And then a lot of these didn't even see market because of E.T. But a few years back, they actually went out to that ditch and dug up all these games. And they actually brought an Atari 2600 with them, and it worked. The games still work. It's still bad. No, actually, some people have said it's even better than Call of Duty. I mean, I wouldn't blame them. I got my Dark Matter camo, and then I kind of stopped playing. I mean, I've even, I, I even went back and started playing Ru Pokemon Ruby Sapphire. I'm still on day three of trying to catch Latias because my RNG is bad. And also, I don't know how to solder a battery in, so I can't go grow my berries. But do you know how to use a soldering iron? It's, uh, it's a yes or no thing. It ain't a little bit. No, no, it's a, it's a yes or no thing. This is a... Po okay, then you do it for me, then. Break my game. Go ahead. Then you, you owe me money if you break it. <laughs> All right, so... Games are bad. No one wants them. So who's going to come in? This little company over in Japan by the name of Nintendo that's been around since 1800s making tr playing cards now shows up and dominates the industry. But if no one wants to buy a video game console, how do you do it? You market it as a toy. You don't say it's a video game console. You say it's a toy. So that little guy up there, for anyone who's played the fighting game known as Super Smash Bros., know who Rob is because you want to know if it wasn't for Smash Bros., you mean the best character ever? I can't say anything. I'm a trash Lucina main. So they sell Rob hundred, about $180. You get Rob two games and the console. But the thing is, this is a toy. You just got to go, you know, go out to Walmart or wh whoever's or Radio Shack, if those are still around, and buy a D battery, two D batteries specifically. Put that, plug him up, and he works. But of course, this is a toy. This is not. This is not a video game. This is a toy. But that's how they sold it. And then after a while, people realized, oh, I don't need Rob to enter to use this. To get my entertainment out of this, I don't need Rob. So they stopped selling Rob, and instead, you just get the Nintendo Entertainment System on its own. Plug it into the TV, and now games are back in the household. It's a household. N video games are a household name now. Nintendo is dominating. They're creating a bunch of games. You got Mario. Zelda, Dragon Quest, Final Fantasy. You have all these games that are coming out in the 80s, giving way to what we have now. Cartridge, and it's all cartridge based. You plug in the cartridge, you turn it on. We're not used to cartridges anymore unless you're a retro gamer. You guys are way too spoiled with discs. If even you guys use discs anymore. For my PC players, uh, stop installing games. Stop installing games and go back. We need to reject modernity and embrace tradition of putting discs and cartridges in. So now video games are back in the household, and now we also have reached the first patch for a game. So the ZX Spectrum saw a platformer called Jet Set Willy that got patched because it was too hard. I know, skill issue. Clearly they've never played a Dark Souls game, and clearly you don't own an air fryer. You're talking way too much. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> All right. So now let's move up from 19 from between 1984 and 87 to the late 80s, early 90s. So Nintendo's making a ton of money. It's great. But the thing is, is that other people want that money. When one person's making too much money, that's a problem because then you enter something called a monopoly. Uh, Disney knows about this. You can ask them, although they won't admit to it. So. Another company shows up, and they make something in 88 called the, S the Mega Drive. This little company known as Sega, originally actually making consoles for the U.S. military. Yeah, I didn't know that either. If it weren't for me, you know, buying a book one day and then reading through this entire thing, I wouldn't have learned that Sega actually made consoles originally for the U.S. military. And then they went to entertainments in the 80s. So they made the Mega Drive and then rebranded it as the Genesis one year later and sold the stateside. So now Sega's here taking the competition. Nintendo isn't going to have that, so they got to do what they do best and innovate. 1989, they released their handheld, the Game Boy. And the Game Boy would be popular until they re-released it as the Game Boy Color in the late 90s, early 2000s. So now we have our first console war, Sega versus Nintendo. But Nintendo comes out on top with the Super Nintendo in 91, and the classic game made by a little company known as Rareware, that is Donkey Kong Country, and its two sequels. 
Now also at this time we start seeing CD-ROMs as a thing because Nintendo decided to pair up with this other company called Sony and they started making a disk drive that would attach to the bottom of your console that never sold outside of Japan. I mean the Famicom and the Super Famicom never really sold outside of Japan. They rebranded it as the Nintendo but they didn't sell any of the cool peripherals aside from the light gun. And that was even just the Nintendo Entertainment System. We never got to see the disk drive. Then we also have the creation of the ESRB rating system because of one small game, which I'll get to in a bit. I just need to talk about the law really quick. I'm not a lawyer, so don't take this as legal advice. So we ha I've, already I've already shown you a bunch of games that have already been made, but I haven't talked about the fighting game yet. Because in 1987 is when technically one of your early fighting games that got popular were made. But the thing is, it was terrible. Has anyone played the original Street Fighter? The original 1987 one. I'm not talking about Street Fighter 2. Okay, so then, okay, great. You know about that trash. It played terribly. Even Capcom admitted it played terribly. I mean, the thing was is that also you had two buttons. You had a punch and a kick button, and the whole point was that you were supposed to press the button harder because it would do more damage. It did have to start somewhere. You're right, and that's how it started because the problem was is that you had people do this and break arcade cabinets, and that's a lot of money. So, what do you, so we can't do that. So we're going to switch it to a six-button layout. And it was the game was still bad. The game, was, the game was still bad, and then they realized they needed to, they needed to make money somehow so th because also half their development team left and created SNK. So they got to make money somehow. So in 1991, they overhauled the entirety of Street Fighter and released Street Fighter II with the sole purpose of making the first one look like a knockoff. And SNK saw this, and also a little company called Data East. And of course, we don't know who Data East is because they're probably not around still because they got s the pants sued off of them. So Capcom made Street Fighter 2 and Data East made Fighter's History two years later. I present to you on one side Street Fighter 2 and on the other I present to you Fighter's History. The suit was because they said three of their characters were stolen. Guile, Ken, and Chun-Li. The verdict was that, yes, they did bar similarities to the characters, but you can't copyright a stereotype. I can make my own fighting game with a person who throws fireballs, has an uppercut, and a spinning roundhouse kick, and I'm not violating anything. But, of course, Capcom wanted to keep as much money as they could and try to own the fighting game industry while they could, so they sued the pants off of them, even though Art of Fighting released the same year as Street Fighter II and it was just as much of a knockoff of Street Fighter 2. So, now let's look at everything that any of note thing. So, 1992 was when Mortal Kombat released and that created the ESRB rating system because apparently it's not appropriate for little children to see, you know, skulls get ripped off. I gave this presentation to my middle schoolers and they said it's completely appropriate and I fear for the future generations. I fear for kids nowadays. That and they also told me they play GTA frequently. That's why you're messed up in the head, is because you played Mortal Kombat <laughs> as a kid. That's why you're messed up. Well, at least you got an anatomy lesson out of it, didn't you? That's not surprising, though. You, tr you, you try really hard with school, so that's why it doesn't surprise me. I'll give you the quiz for this afterwards. 40 questions, multiple choice, some free response. So now the arcade cabinets have to die because all good things have to come to an end. And now arcades start dying out slowly because of, a of another fighting game made by the same people who made Donkey Kong Country called Killer Instinct. Because apparently the quadruple S tier is not supposed to exist and we shouldn't have an infinite combo in our game. I'm still going to say that's a skill issue. But they realized game balance is a thing and they went and fixed it. But it cost them a lot of money. So then, if this is the problem, either you put out a game that's good, or you're going to waste money fixing it. Take that lesson to heart. Street Fighter 2 releases in 91 and begins the fighting game craze of the 90s, and also we have every core mechanic of a fighting game there, combos, and also a killer soundtrack. And then this new guy uh, releases a game for the Nintendo Entertainment System, the one of the few last ones made. Uh, his name is Masahiro Sakurai. He made a game called Kirby's Dream World. Uh, he's Definitely not going to be important later. Uh, we have some non-licensed Nintendo games that I have to mention. I'm legally obligated to say this. Uh, I've been told by everybody that I need to. And by that, I'm lying. No one has told me I need to mention this, and they want me to bury this. Uh, 
Hotel Mario, Link, The Faces of Evil, and Zelda 1 and Gamelon, the, nine less, the non-licensed Nintendo games from the Philips CDI era of the 90s. If you're familiar with the old days of YouTube and YouTube poops, then you are very familiar with this, whether you want to admit it or not. And 1992, we get the competitor to Mario that is Sonic the Hedgehog, even though the flagship title for the Sega was Mega Man. Sonic is more relevant than Mega Man. Sorry to say that. Because, I mean, Sonic got to add first Smash Bros. before Mega Man. Cry about it. All right, now it's, i got to cover 10 years in a short amount of time. So, Nintendo thinks that they're on top of everything because they made Donkey Kong Country, so they decided to make a handheld that was also a VR headset. They made the Virtual Boy. It was bad. No one wants to talk about it. But I have to talk about it here. So while they were work while they were failing with the Virtual Boy, they were working on a new game engine called what they called the Ultra 64 engine. That and also because Rareware accidentally advertised it with uh, Killer Instinct 2. And in 1996, we get the Nintendo 64. But there's one problem: the Nintendo 64 is not going to win in this time of video game history because you released the PlayStation in 1994, and the Sega Saturn releases in 1994. Even though PlayStation wins this era because memory cards and a ton of great PS1 games. And Sega Saturn kind of falls in second place because of uh, their little issue they had, a hardware issue of having a battery control your save data. Everyone kind of learned this one the hard way. I even had to learn it the hard way when I found a refurbished copy of Pokemon Silver. And that's when I learned that batteries saved the save state. I was upset. But Nintendo had to then come in and try to earn some money, so in 1998 they released the Game Boy Color, taking all of their games that were originally on this uh, green and black pixelated screen and put them in full-blown color. You're supposed to be surprised by that. It's a big thing. At this time, it's a big thing. Uh, but PC is still, of course, dominating. I'm not going to be speaking a lot about PC because PC still does better than consoles, no matter what. No matter which way you want to cut it, PC is going to do better. And I feel as I'm going to be saying the same thing 15 times if every slide I say PC did better than everybody. But I have to, I have to say this because of uh, the first first-person, sh one of the first FPSs created, Doom, from id Software, 1993. It was a little trick they did for 3D. It wasn't even 3D. They made it look 3D. Because that's why you have a shotgun with stupid range. So we have two generations of consoles that happen here. So 93 to 98 is the fifth generation, and the sixth generation is 98 to 2003. We had a lot of developments here pretty quickly. All right, there's a lot here. Try rapid fire this. 1996, one of the first 3D platformers, Super Mario 64. We're not counting Bubsy. That didn't exist. Uh, 1997, Rareware. Still, people that, they got a, peop a group of people that didn't know how to make games, and they told them to make a movie tie-in game for 1995's GoldenEye. You know, no pressure. You're just going to make a game off of one of the best-selling movies of 1995 that had Pierce Brosnan. No pressure. But then they would take it, it would become popular, and they would refer Brand, they would fix it and make it better in 2000 with Perfect Dark Zero. Uh, so that Masahiro Sakurai guy comes back and actually creates a brand new IP using existing Nintendo characters in 1999 called Super Smash Brothers. Despite his philosophy of avoiding sequels, it spawned five sequels. I'm counting DS and Wii U as separate. Fight me about it later. Uh, 1996, Nintendo releases their one of their biggest titles uh, and uh, still ongoing franchise, now going on nine generations with the Paldea region, uh, Pokemon. Pokemon Red, Blue released in this year. Well, Red and Green uh, released in this year. Then they re-released it in the st on stateside as Red and Blue. And then they fix it by releasing a third game called Yellow. We need to go back to doing that. Uh, 1999, this guy named Tony Hawk does something called the 900, and then he got a game made about him. Even though they told them six months to make a game, and it became the first extreme sports game to be popularized. Yeah, we had Madden and hockey before that, but it wasn't until Tony Hawk entered the house that people cared about sports games, really. Because it came out on three platforms, and it was still one of the best sports games to this day. I still have a copy of it. Don't fight me. What? Yes. 
I may have messed up my knee. I messed up my knee at Kona. It was worth it. All right, so you have two platformers. You have the new competitor, the new mascot, because everyone had a mascot. So Crash Bandicoot comes in as a competitor to Nintendo because PlayStation needed something. They then got Spyro. Uh, Banjo-Kazooie releases in 98 because Rareware is still making games until they don't. Doom releases in 93. Uh, first 3D RPG releases in 1997, Final Fantasy VII. Uh, if you bought the remake, you were stealing yourself out of money. You were losing money by doing that because they're releasing two more parts out of it. And I don't own a PS5. And you need a PS5 to get the next part. And I'm not spending $500 on that. Uh, so then a new competitor joins the mix, also of game consoles at this time in 2001. Uh, a little company known as Microsoft. They made a console. And then their launch title was this uh, cool, neat first-person shooter called Halo. Halo Combat Evolved. Kind of got popular with uh, its sequel, Halo 2, and its multiplayer. And then Halo 3. But that's I'm jumping too far ahead. Uh, then you have two games that are competi competed as the best games of all time, which are Half-Life and Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. Uh, but now Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time is no longer in that running because of something called Tears of the Kingdom. You need to stop talking. Stop ruining this for everybody. <laughs> it don't matter about the bugs. I played Sword and Shield with all the bugs that it had, and I still had a good time. You are a party pooper. There's the door. He needs to take your class. That guy. Yes, officer, that man right there in the gray shirt. That one right there. That one right there needs to take your class and that graphics don't make a game. I didn't even take your class and I knew that. How about a game that works? I, I Storylines are great. Assassin's Creed was great. But how about a game that works? Have you tried that? But I'm saying, how about you play a game that works? That's what makes a game. All right, so people are now realizing that they can do things on their own because a bunch of Half-Life mods led to Counter-Strike. And now we got Counter-Strike 2 recently. Counter-Strike 2. You have live simulation games with this dude named Will Wright. I don't know if some of you guys have met him or something. I didn't get to meet him. I'm sad about that. They didn't tell me he was going to be somewhere. But he makes The Sims, and we start getting, we start seeing life simulation games. Uh, Shenmue, a little underground game that no one really knew about at the time, actually created the Quick Time event. So if you ever played a game that has you press buttons at a certain times and you hate it, blind this series. Just don't invent a time machine and go kill that guy because then you're gonna uh, actually make some bad games in the future probably. So Sega ends their run of making consoles here with the Dreamcast. While yes, they were very they were technically the best of everyone they just couldn't keep up anymore they the demands of their console with everything that they were trying to do versus the xbox and now the playstation 2 just couldn't keep up so they retire from making consoles and go strictly to games and i'm about to make a lot of people feel old in here 2000 is when the ps2 released six years later we got the ps3 the GameCube releases in 2001, the DS in 2004, and the Nintendo Wii in 2006. The like Xbox releases in 2001, and in 2005, the Xbox 360. You feel old yet? And also, you have the seventh generation, and it happens in two years. A whole generation of consoles. Now, we're used to seeing this that be like at least five years. We're seeing this happen in two. Too quick. I feel old. Bring me back the Game Boy Advance and playing Ruby Sapphire. All right. So we now are trying to bridge between games and actually fitness and actually all these different peripherals. So Wii Fit does a whole peripheral with a balance board in 2007, and uh, the one the wonderful PR that was Reggie fills me saying his body is ready. My his his body is ready. He is ready to uh, realize that he is not ready for Wii Fit. The Sims released in 2000, spawning all the different sequels and spin-offs. Uh, plastic instrument genre, I, that is its own separate genre. I will count that as its own separate genre. You can, go find, you can go find me somewhere else about it. Guitar Hero 3 and Rock Band released in 2007 as competitors to one another, releasing the plastic instrument genre. 
and also creating the hardest song in a rhythm game to date. Nothing will beat Through the Fire and Flames, even if you overchart a song, because that's not official. Clone Hero can eat, you can take your Clone Hero cake and eat it somewhere else, not here. Uh, Call of Duty 4 released in 2007 as the only Call of Duty game to get Game of the Year. Cry about it. Never get Game of the Year again. Cold War was fun, though. Cold War. Cold. Rod, can I officially kick someone out? He's banned. No, out. I am not okay with that. Black Ops 2 is still the best. Halo series releases in 2001 and still going to this day. That's why I've put present. I've been wanting to put its final year there for such a long time because this franchise has gone on for too long. I had a whole student that told me the entire Halo lore. I zoned out after Halo 1. Uh, Grand Theft Auto becomes popular this time with San Andreas releasing in 2004 and being re-released actually only like, what, two years ago? That's why I bought an original copy of San Andreas so I can enter the G-codes. <laughs> World of Warcraft is an RPG that's still going to this date. I have the 2004 release date even though all their DLCs are still going and you can't get that World Explorer achievement because they're adding so much. All right, so 2008, 2013-ish. I have to put ish because the release of the Wii U, PlayStation 4, and Xbox One kind of create this small divide in the generations. But at the same time, we're wrapping up everything here with the uh, 360 and PS3 and the Wii. Also because of my resources saying that 2008 marks the next generation because of mobile gaming. Mobile games are games too. Uh, Call of Duty... Uh, Rock Band, a few other games actually are beginning to surge with their downloadable content and releasing what was supposed to be add-ons to your games that make it better. I mean, look at Assassin's Creed 2. The DLC for that actually made the game better and finished the story out. You didn't need it, but you could get it. But now we're making games that are incomplete okay. Because you need the DLC to finish this game. You need the DLC to make this game better. Uh, we now enter this also era of esports with the one game and that I'm going to acknowledge as esports, even though uh, some other people will fight me, especially if Hi-Rez is here and they want to come hang me, they're more than welcome to. Uh, League of Legends. League of Legends creating esports and now the big issue of cross-platform. Because I own an Xbox, my friend owns a PlayStation, we both own Call of Duty, I want to dog on him in Modern Warfare 2 with an intervention, but I can't. I can't because of the fact that everyone's protective of their servers. So now this issue about cross-platform arises, and I can't play with my friends because he owns a PlayStation, and I own an Xbox. So there's an issue. And then everyone starts arguing about what the best platform is. And if you say anything that is not a PC, you are incorrect. Because PC is still beating everybody at this time. Because we're able to mod games. We can mod Skyrim. You can, you can also possibly mod Skyrim on your refrigerator. And your PlayStation. And your toaster. I mean, I, mean, I, I, I clearly own Skyrim on my refrigerator. Yes. Yes, there is. Skyrim VR. All right. 2009 begins the release of the Soulsborne series with Demon Souls being re-released on the PS5, if anyone owns a PS5, that is. League of Legends 2009, Battlefield 4 in 2013. I have to say this because of being bugged on launch and people falling through the floor and then uh, apparently it's okay to ask sound designers at Siege, hey, your game sucked because I fell through the floor but they're only sound designers, and they did their job because you're still hearing things when you fall through the floor. Destiny releases in 2014. Uh, that was kind of bad because you had to buy DLC for it. But now that's kind of the norm of buying DLC for games. This is also a hint for anyone that's making games to actually release a full game. Uh, collectibles start taking America by storm with Amiibos, although it originally started with Skylanders. 
I have to say Amiibos because we kind of forgot about Skylanders. You're weird. You're weird because you still remember Skylanders and you said Cold War was bad. I'm not going to deny that. I'm not going to deny that Skylanders is good. There's nothing wrong with collecting them. I'm going to be real with you, man. There's nothing wrong. I'm just making jokes up here because I think I'm funny. So now also here we get games that are being remastered. I mean, we've been doing this since the early 2000s because Nintendo decided that they wanted to revamp their entire series of Pokemon. So they released Fire Red and Leaf Green. Uh, Call of Duty becomes the most reused franchise after 10 years of games after they released COD Ghosts. And then the greatest game of all time that is Minecraft. How much do I gotta pay you to like physically drag this guy out? How much do I gotta pay you? I'm tired of this Minecraft slander. He already said one thing saying it's a mid game. I'm tired of the slander. He slandered Minecraft saying it's an okay game. It's only good if you have friends. All right, so now I gotta take a quick break from all this uh, console junk to talk about mobile gaming and VR and AR. So summer 2016, the biggest AR game to be released was Pokemon Go. People still play that apparently. Uh, PSVR releases in 2016 of October. The HTC Vive releases in April of 2016. The HoloLens releases in March 2016. And all these projects of actually utilizing VR and AR to be helpful instead of just making games. Uh, Uncharted VR, what? No, Uncharted. It's, uh, I'm talking about VR and AR here. If we're not, ta if it's not VR and AR, then we can't put it here. One day, one day we'll get Uncharted on VR, and I think people will pay for that. People will pay for it, like they paid for Skyrim on the refrigerator. All right, current era, 2016 to 2023. 4K resolution now becomes a thing, and we're going to go ahead and start putting everything 4K compatible, so you better buy that 4K TV. If you don't have $300 for a 4K TV, tough luck. Ninth generation begins in 2017 with the release of the Nintendo Switch, and going all the way to now what is the PlayStation 5. The PS4 Pro releases in 2016, and the Xbox One X in 2017, who with beginning this 4K compatible era, and the Nintendo Switch releasing in 2017 with the launch title that is Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. All right, everything between 2017 and 2022. You have Destiny 2 releasing in 2017. It's 4K, it's great. Graphics, graphics are wonderful, but the game sucks. Because in, I thought you said graphics made a game. You said, you said earlier, graphics made the game. You, you said, I am taking your statement and I'm using it against you. You said graphics made a game. <laughs> Liar! So do I, because it's better. Because also, the, you didn't need the graphics to make the game. Battlefield 1 releases in 2016 with this new idea of free DLC. From EA. Yeah, of all companies, EA. EA's making free DLC. But it was a business gambit. They were doing something. They were starting something new. Well, another company was. Sonic Mania releases in 2017 because we cannot let old habits die. We remastered COD 4 in 2017, but that was only because Infinite Warfare was something no one wanted to buy. Clone Hero releases in 2017 as the Guitar Hero clone we wanted. Because instead I could actually rip everything from the old Guitar Hero games and put it all on one platform. That's not illegal. Breath of the Wild releases in 2017 as the contender for best game of all time. Now we're going to scrub that and actually replace it with uh, Tears of the Kingdom. And the fact that now I can play Tony Hawk Legend of Zelda edition. War Crimes and the fact that I can take uh, Korok and go across the entirety of the kingdom on a crucifix. You could, you could start a religion with that. Uh, now, unfortunately, despite every part of me not wanting to do this, I have to. Fortnite releasing in 2017 as the highest grossing free-to-play game of all time. Let that sink in for a bit. Highest grossing free-to-play game of all time. It's a business gambit they did with this whole battle pass idea that everyone then started taking. It's a terrible business practice in my opinion, but it's one that works.
yo, where's Despacito to? <laughs> I take your Warzone 2 and I raise you Despacito 2. Spire and Crash Bandicoot get, re get a remaster in 2019 because apparently we've been wanting that. That, that actually is kind of something we wanted because everyone wants to go. We are rejecting modernity at this point. Reject modernity. Return to tradition. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 and 2 gets released in 2020 in the height of uh, the um, demonetization virus. I can't say it because this is on YouTube and this is probably going to be stayed on YouTube. And I think y'all want your monetization money. So I can't say the virus name. I, ca I can't say the de I, well, I got demonetized for it if I say it. The demonetization virus. The demonetization virus from COVID uh, comes around. It actually has made games harder to make at this time, but still uh, they're pushing through. So any game that's actually released between 2020 and 2022, I kind of excuse for not being the best because everyone's being forced to work from home. And Elden Ring, most importantly, as the most recent game of the year, and it is a very accessible Soulsborne game. If you've never played a Soulsborne game, you have no experience with it, you can pick up Elden Ring and still do fine. Because it's too easy. It's like playing Pokemon X and Y the first time you over-level. Alright, so that, and of course, 2023 now, with where we're at, with uh, Tears of the Kingdom as the most recent release most recent notable release. I'm not going to count anything that's been released, and I'm stopping the remasters. I'm stopping the remasters with where we're at right now. No more remasters. Because then I have to start saying, Last of, the Last of Us remastered, and what other, re what other remasters are there? A s GTA remastered? I'm tired of the remasters. Let's just go, let's just cut it here and go to talking about what happened bad all these years. All right. So, what is it you can do to prevent games from actually, you know, not sucking? For one, don't care about your graphics. You need to learn to not care about your graphics and actually care about making a good game. I've said this multiple times. Make the mechanics first. I've even taught my students this. Make your mechanics first. Your cosmetics can wait. You know, I had a student actually do that. They actually made their cosmetics first and then the game last. And then they spent an entire class period sitting at my desk complaining, why isn't my game working? Because you cared more about your cosmetics than actually making a functioning game. Keep your IPs close, but not too close. That's the first thing. Nintendo CDI. That little stint with the Philips CDI that they made terrible flops. I can't even say anything bad about them because I love those cutscenes. They're so terrible, they're good. It's like watching Tommy Wiseau's The Room. You can't, you gotta keep your IPs close, but don't keep them too close. Let people try them out, let people use them. But don't be Nintendo and start striking everybody that makes anything better than you. Uh, I have to mention this 3D platformer, uh, Bubsy the Bobcat, because his death happened in the PS1 with his 3D platformer. Look at the top right corner and all those pixels. We've never seen them again for a reason. Even though someone, there is someone out there that's probably making a remake. Uh, Movie-based video games have always been sort of bad. We saw that originally with E.T. And then also making game-based movies. But I can't say that anymore because of the company that is Illumination. And making the Mario movie. That was actually kind of good. Even if they did have... Uh, Majority of it was majority of the budget just went to music. Majority of it was to just me sitting there listening to Take on Me and trying to hit the high note because that's what you do when you listen to Take on Me. All right, and trying to please the community. You can't make everybody happy, so stop trying to make everybody happy. I read that in a book once. If you sit and try to make everybody happy, you're not going to have a good game. You're instead just going to be a crowd pleaser, and then no one's going to like your game. And most importantly, make a f game that is playable on launch. Tony Hawk 5 releases in 2015, and the initial update was twice the size of the base game. I'm sorry, but I take yeah, that, your Pokemon complaints, and I raise you a 12 gigabyte update on day one.
that's not twice the size. That's not twice the size. Tony Hawk, to Tony Hawk 5 releases as a 5 gigabyte game, and then the first update is 10. How much do I got to pay you to kick this guy out? How much do I got to pay someone to get rid of this guy? I'm tired of his slander. Slander. All right. A big problem in the industry is oversaturation because we have t if we have too much of a good thing, it dies. First-person shooters. Plastic instrument games. Battle royales. If you have too much of a good thing, it's going to kill the game genre. A lot of games that are out there are actually kind of good, but the problem is, is that we can't see that they're good because something else has killed it. And now more recently, as the most recent addition to this oversaturation problem is mascot horror. Indie mascot horror and some guy back in 2014 who made four games in two, in two years that were all functional, by the way. They were all functional. Impressive. A guy named Scott Cawthon actually made... A lot, of, a lot of games in a short amount of time, but now, because of his popularity, everyone's oversaturating the market with it. That's how you kill a game pretty quickly. So what's next? I don't know. When will we get 8K? Uh, why aren't we happy? Because we don't know what we want. Just play what makes you happy at this point. There is no best game of all time. I'm just saying all this because I know there's someone who's going to be happy if I say something about that. Is there a massive platform? No. All that matters is you're having fun with the games that you play. That's all that matters. That's what games are for. It's for fun, not to be better than anyone or make something. I mean, there are some art masterpieces of games. Like, Doki Doki Literature Club is a masterpiece of horror. In terms of writing and storytelling, it is a masterpiece of horror. There are games that are masterpieces. There are games that are not. But as long as you have fun, that's what matters. All right, any questions, comments, concerns, cries of outrage in these last five minutes that I've been given that Andrew kind of held up five? I thought he was telling me to shut up. I can't remember. All right, Valencia, what's your question? Yes, that is correct, but at the same time, Mortal Kombat is still remembered and it's still going on to this day. I mean, we're about to get another Mortal Kombat game sometime this year or next year, I want to say. September of this year? God dang! I mean, we got Street Fighter VI this year, so I mean, I can't really complain. We're having games that are going from the 90s till today. Yes. Never played it, but uh, I will not argue with you. Are any question any questions? Yes. So we've been doing consoles since 2000. So the modern consoles that we have now, Nintendo, Sony, and Microsoft, we've been seeing since the early 2000s. We've gotten used to it. We know it almost inside and out. The, soft the hardware is a little bit easier for us to access and actually work with, even though we've been using PCs for such a long time and have been playing games on them, making games using them. The reason that we have all these PC issues is because of the fact that we're trying to upgrade the graphics. If we weren't so concerned if people weren't so concerned about getting 60 fps 4k and being able to see the pores on characters faces when they're playing final fantasy 7 remastered then we wouldn't have these issues even simple games that have very rudimentary graphics are perfect because we're focusing on the game mechanics rather than making them look pretty so even then you're th sitting 30 fps on console but the game works fine because you're not concerned about graphics Last question, Dr. Obando. Oh. Oh, uh, can we hold that for afterwards then? Because I want to get one last question in. Is it, please tell me it's an actual question. Quickly, go. Why stop EA Nintendo Direct's uh, demonetization virus? And then everyone starts, comp everyone starts getting all these hopes up for games. And then when they're let down, then the company gets backlash for it. You can't make promises that you can't keep. And that's the problem with it. Because if I'm going to say that I'm going to make you a great game, it's going to be wonderful, but then I don't deliver on it, 
Who are you going to be mad at? You're going to be mad at me for making the game. Because I, I failed to do something that I promised you. And a lot of people, a lot of companies are doing that. They're failing to deliver on these promises. Maybe if we stop making all these over-the-top things and all these big promises and focus on just core mechanics and actually a game that works, base functionality, we can actually start making some good games again. All right. Thank you, guys.